Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I will continue in the study of the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to pick up in chapter 21. Now, if you have not seen the previous episodes of this study, they are uploaded on, on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. However, the book of Proverbs is, I believe, a unique book in that it's really not necessary to um, study it in context because you can open the book of Proverbs up any chapter, any verse, and just pick it up right there and uh, you'll gain wisdom. That's the whole point of the book. Uh, King Solomon wrote it. He says the purpose of writing it was so that he could teach his son wisdom. And it's a series of wise sayings. Uh, some of these sayings, these ideas, um, are repeated over and over again throughout the, 20, the 31 chapters. But um, it's, not, it's not like the other books in the Bible. See, the, this Bible... The Word of God is really 66 books. People think of this as being a book, but it's it's a collection of 66 books. Uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, and 27 books in the New Testament. And these books were written over about a 15 or 1600 year span. And they were written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. They're written by over 40 different authors. The authors were kind of used like, like I use a pen. God used these men to write what he want, wanted written. But these, these men were from a wide range of uh, walks of life, fishermen, farmers, shepherds, kings, historians. Um, and they, they wrote these books, and yet they are all compiled, compiled to make one book, one story. And from beginning to the end, it's the story about our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. And the fact that God wants us to have eternal life with him in heaven and that through from the, the Bible from beginning to end tells us this story of redemption, that God would provide a solution, a remedy, a cure, a, a way of getting reconciliation with God. And God would provide it. And uh, throughout the whole Bible, it's talking about this thing that God will do uh, and it required a sacrifice it required a death it re required shedding of blood uh, so that so that man's sins could be paid for and man could be reconciled with God and have a relationship with God that's what the whole Bible really is all about uh, but the 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 books of the Bible are really real stories and they're true stories the genesis account is is a true account of creation uh, if if you think that it the genesis account of creation is just a fable or you know a parable or something like that but not an actual event then uh, you're wrong uh, it, it, it's the same same thing with Jonah and the whale. Uh, the same thing with Noah, the ark and the flood. These are real historical events about real people and real events. And this is a this is a history book. It's his story, history, the story about. Jesus Christ, who is our great Savior God, 
who is the creator and the savior. So that's what the Bible is about. And all these books, it's important that you get context in all of them. But the book of Proverbs, context is not needed. Uh, so you can join this study tonight at any point and still gain a lot and understand it because you don't have to read the book of Proverbs from chapter one all consecutively to chapter 31. That's the interesting thing about this book. Sometimes one verse stands alone and teaches us a principle or an ideal. Sometimes it's two or three verses in a row to make a point, and then it moves on and makes another point. Uh, so this is a, a fun book to read, and uh, it's full of one nugget after another, nuggets of, of truth and wisdom. So I'm going to pick up now in the chapter 21, and I'm going to, I'm a KJV firstist. That means that uh, I read the KJV first. That's the King James Version, the King James Translation. I read it first because that's the one I trust, and that's what I consider to be the scriptures. And then I sometimes like looking at commentaries or other translations, but I look at them as a, uh, like a commentary rather than a translation. The one I like to use is the Amplify, because it amplifies the verses. Just as I'm going to try to do verbally, as I read the verse, I will amplify giving you my thoughts, my way of explaining what the verse means to me. Uh, the Amplified Translation, the publishers, the translators, they, they amplify it so that we can get their perspective on what the verse means. So let's begin. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Well, this, this really brings up the, uh, an issue. Right away we have an issue here. And, and that is the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. I have a playlist. Uh, oh, I have pro many videos on the playlist, but uh, probably about five or ten of the videos I've made, I probably made about ten hours teaching on this subject, and it's Calvinism. And the title of the playlist is Calvinism Debunked, because I, I don't believe in Calvinism. I think it's one of the most hateful, evil philosophies ever invented by men. Um, but the, the Calvinists think that the sovereignty of God means that God controls every thought, word, and deed of man, and, um, and, and man does not have free will. God, man is not making his own choices. Um, but if that was true, that would mean that... Uh, I never really sinned. I'm just a puppet and God's controlling me. Uh, it's like if I was uh, if, if I was a gun and God used me to shoot some used a gun to shoot someone, can you blame the gun? No. God would be guilty because he's the one that used the gun to shoot someone. So uh, if God controls man, like he would control a gun or a puppet or a robot, then you can't blame the gun. You can't blame the puppet. You can't blame human, humans because they're just a tool that God's using. They're controlled completely. Therefore, that means that, that man is a totally innocent party, just a tool being used by God. And it, it makes God the guilty party. God is the one that's actually doing the sinning. God is the one that's really evil. Man is innocent. Even Lucifer, Satan, he is innocent in Calvinism. Uh, so I despise everything about Calvinism. Um, but there are certain verses in the Bible that they use and, and to try to prove their, their, their point or make their case for Calvinism. It's easily debunked and disproven 
But the, the true way that sovereignty works, the sovereignty of God is God is able to do whatever he wants. God is, God is omnipotent. That means he can all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. He could lift me off the ground right now. And, you know, he could, uh, he, he could influence me or actually control me if he wants, but he doesn't do it because in his sovereignty, he decided to let me dec decide how I'm going to live my life and make my decisions. And, um, that way, if I make do bad things, I'm the guilty party, not him. So the truth is that uh, God can do whatever he wants, but he doesn't control every thought, word, and deed of men. We have free will. We control that ourselves. But God is also sovereign in the respect that he is free to intervene whenever he wants to or needs to, to make things go how he wants and influence man and interact with man. So from time to time, God will uh, step in. But he's not 100% of the time absolutely controlling every thought, word, and deed of man. But the reason I had to explain that is because I can see right away that this is a verse that a Calvinist might use to support their viewpoint that man is does not have free will, that God is controlling him. Because it says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the river uh, rivers of water, he turneth it whither, whithersoever he will. I'll read that in the Amplified. So the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whichever way he wishes. So it's, it is true that God is able to do that. But he doesn't take sovereignty to the extent that he is controlling every action that, that we do. But when he thinks it's necessary... He will control act, control the world or control whatever he wants to do. Now, verse 2, uh, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Uh, and the Amplified says, every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs and examines the hearts of people and their motives. So right here in this verse, we have a, uh, a verse that would dispute the extreme viewpoint that God is controlling everything and man doesn't have a free will. You see, it says uh, every man's way is right in his own eyes. So that's, the, that's telling us that each of us decides which way we're going to go. We decide what's right and, our wrong, and wrong. But the Lord weighs and examines our heart. Now, he can only examine our heart uh, if, if we are the ones making the decisions. There's no way he examines our heart. Our heart is not a factor at all if he's making all the decisions and controlling us. But the real point of this verse here, apart from Calvinism, is to tell us that um, the decisions, the, the way man sees everything, man's way is not the same as God's way. Um, for example, in salvation, the, man, the way that man thinks salvation should be is a merit system. Man thinks that in order to go to heaven, it, it will be based upon personal merit. Those people who deserve to go to heaven get to go, and those people who don't deserve it don't get to go to heaven. They go to hell, or but not heaven, because they don't deserve it. Um, that's what man thinks. That's, that's the philosophy of man. That's been the philosophy throughout the history of man. That's the prominent, predominant philosophy in the world today. And yet, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 3, that uh, a man is trying to establish his own righteousness as a means of getting salvation, but that's not God's way. So the, the way that seems right to man, personal merit, that's not the way God's doing it, though. 
God has his own way of doing it. Because if God knows what's best, if God knows that if we were going to all go to heaven based upon personal merit, none of us would have enough merit. <laughs> because in order to be with God in heaven, we have to be perfect. Uh, some people sin more than others, and some see people sin less than others. But no person is sinless. Some people sin less, but none of us are completely sinless without sin. And if we have any sin at all, then we're not perfect. And therefore, we can't be with God because we have to be perfect. So man's attempt to get into heaven through personal merit is, is doomed to failure. And that's why the Bible says that the righteousness of man, our attempts to be good, are like filthy rags in the sight of God. We try to be good and get to heaven through our own merit, and God just looks at disgust as saying, oh, you're, you're a sinner. You're unacceptable. I know, I know some people sin more than you, but you're still a sinner, and I, you're unacceptable. So what God did was... Uh, he, he said, my way is I'll solve the problem for man. I'll pay for their sins. And therefore, they will be sinless. And I can have a relationship with them. And that's what he did. Uh, he became a man named Jesus. He died on a cross and paid for all of our sins. Now sin is not a barrier between man and God. We can have a relationship with God and go to heaven, provided that we do the one thing that God requires us to do, and that is st stop believing in our own ability to get to heaven through our own efforts, reject that, say, God, I surrender. I'm, I, I know that I can never do it. That's why I need Jesus to be my Savior. And you put your faith in Jesus. You depend on him rather than trying to do it on your own. Now, that's God's way. Trust Jesus is God's way. Personal merit is man's way. So you can try to do it your own way if you want. But uh, it's doomed to failure because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The, a man's attempt to reach a level that's acceptable to God, it always falls short. So for that reason, um, uh, God had to establish a solution to our problem. And uh, man's way and God's way are not the same. And that, in this verse here, it, it relates to that. That's why I had to go off on this salvation message because it says every man's way in, is right in his own eyes. Man thinks, oh, it's logical. It's, it's just the way the world is. You know, uh, uh, if you do good, you know, uh, you deserve a reward for it. Uh, if, you, if you do bad, you deserve to be punished for it. Uh, so man thinks that's the way that heaven works too. If you do good, you deserve to go to heaven as a reward for behaving and being good. But that's not God's way. God's way is trust Jesus. So, but the Lord weighs and examines the hearts of people and their motives. So, see, sometimes it's, it's not even a question of what we do. Uh, you can do good things with the wrong motives, it's according to this verse here. And like, for example... Uh, Jesus condemned the practice of praying publicly if your motive was to get attention from other people and praise from other people. And, and, and if you're praying publicly so that people will say, oh, look at him, he's very religious. What a good man he is. Jesus says, well, if that's what you're doing, you'll get your reward now. But you won't have a reward in heaven because your motive was the wrong reason. That's why he said, go pray inside a closet. That means go pray in private. Because if you want to pray and have a conversation with God, if you do it in private, then your motive is not public attention. Your motive is you want to talk to God. So this verse here is telling us that... Uh, our motives, our what intentions of our heart is very important too. Now let's go to 
verse 3, it says, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Um, and the Amplified says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice for wrongs repeatedly committed. Uh, so why would you do sacrifice? Well, it was, uh, it was the practice of the, uh, uh, the Jews, or we'll call them the Jews, uh, Israel, uh, the, the people who followed Judaism, who believed in the laws of Moses, uh, these people, and even before them, going all the way back to uh, Cain and Abel was the first record of these sacrifices. But throughout the history, man has done sacrifices for, to God. And the point of the sacrifice was to somehow appease God. When, when Cain did his sacrifice, he farmed, he worked really hard, and he got his crops together and he sacrificed it. He burned it. And, and so he offered a sacrifice that was the, the uh, result of his work and his labor. Now, you think God liked that sacrifice? You, you might think he liked it because Cain worked hard. But God was not pleased with his sacrifice because his sacrifice was based upon his own work, his own merit, his own effort. And that's the same problem with man's attempt to gain salvation through their own effort. That's not God's way. God was pleased with the sacrifice of Abel. It was an animal sacrifice. Blood was shed. A life was, was uh, taken. Now you might say, well, that's cruel and that's bloody and that's gruesome. But the animal sacrifice, the death, the shed blood was a picture it was symbolic of a future bloody sacrifice that would be given to, for, to pay for the sins of all mankind and that happened 2000 years ago jesus was this sacrifice that god had promised throughout history and when jesus died on the cross it served as a sacrifice a payment a propitiation for all of man's sins so here we have uh, the practice of doing these sacrifices as a means of covering up for our sins, whereas Jesus' sacrifice didn't cover up for our sins. It just like didn't cover it up and like, okay, you put a covering over it and you don't see it. But what Jesus' sacrifice did, it totally removed it. It paid for it. Uh, but all the sacrifices... We're serving the purpose of covering up our sins. And this is saying, if you continue to do wrong things and just making sacrifices, it's not as good as just doing the right things. Don't just keep on doing the wrong thing and then make it a sacrifice. It's like in Roman Catholicism, the largest uh, false religious cult in the world. Watch my playlist, Roman Catholicism debunked for a complete refutation of Roman Catholicism. But what they do is they continue to, every every week they, they sin and whatever sins they have, they go and confess it and they make another sacrifice in terms of the, the mass and uh, they take their communion and then they do it all over again next week. But the Bible says that Jesus' death served as a one-time sacrifice for all time, and we should not continue making any more sacrifices. In fact, the Jewish people can't make, can't make any sacrifices because in 70 AD, their temple was destroyed, just as Jesus prophesied. He prophesied 40 years earlier that the temple would be torn down, not one stone we left on top of another. And sure enough, 40 years later, 70 AD, Titus conquered Jerusalem. They destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and not one stone was left on another. And since then, the Jewish people have not really been able to practice Judaism because they don't have a temple. They can't do their sacrifices. But in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that 
Uh, Jesus' death on the cross serves as the final sacrifice, the only real sacrifice that matters, and we shouldn't continue doing any other sacrifices because the sacrificial system is over after Jesus died for our sins. But here is telling us to do righteous, go, to do the right thing is better to the Lord than doing the wrong thing and just keep on making sacrifices. Like Roman Catholics, just start doing the right thing instead of just sinning and then going, and con going back to confession to the priest every week. Okay, now let me go to the next verse in the KJV. It says, a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. A high look and a proud heart, that's just pride. And a plowing of the wicked, um, I'm not sure what that means. A plowing of the wicked, it seemed like it would be like a tearing up of the wicked. Uh, is sin, but I must not mean that. Let me see it in the Amplify. It says, haughty and arrogant eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked. Okay. Okay. The lamp of the wicked, that's their self-centered pride, is sin. So there's wicked people who are full of pride. They're haughty, they're arrogant, and... Uh, the lamp of the wicked. In other words, the way that we, one way we see that people are wicked is this display of, of pride and arrogance. And God, the Bible says that is sin, pride and arrogance. Verse five, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of every one that is hasty, only to want. It's kind of like the uh, the tortoise in the air, you know. Uh, don't be too big of a hurry to get to get things. Uh, when you hurry in a big hurry, you end up making a lot of mistakes. It's like playing chess. I got pretty good at chess many years ago, and I played regular chess. Some of the people I knew played speed chess. And in chess, if you make a minor error, you know, it's, it's common, but if you make a big mistake, a critical mistake, in chess terminology, it's called a blunder. And, and if you play slowly, it takes the proper amount of time to make your decisions, you're less likely to make these blunders. But in speed chess, you know, it's very common you make blunders because you're not taking enough thought and putting enough thought into it and planning well enough. So it's more common it's a series of blunders in speed chess. That's the same thing in life. Be thoughtful, pensive, take your time, plan out your life, make a good plan, set goals, uh, and can be diligent. And then you'll have plenty. You'll be successful. But if you're just really quick to try to get rich quick and, and uh, not willing to be patient and diligent, then you're going to end up wanting instead, lacking. You'll be in poverty. Let me look at that in the Amplified. That's verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance and advantage, but everyone who acts in haste comes surely to poverty. Now, these things are not just interesting ideas to talk about and, and beautiful principles to learn. These are virtues to be acquired and applied in our lives. That's what we hope happens by studying the book of Proverbs. Verse 6, the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. Okay. So it's talking about someone trying to get ahead in life by lying. That's similar to the previous verse when it's talking about people trying to take shortcuts and, and, and get things quickly instead of being diligent and patient and taking your time and achieving your goals gradually uh, and lying is a form of a shortcut it's not only dishonest but it's a lazy way to try to gain something through lying 
and it says it results give you will get bad results it says here uh, you'll be tossed to and fro and and probably end up with death six in the amplified says acquiring treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor the seeking and pursuit of death verse seven the robbery of the wicked shall destroy them because they refuse to do judgment hmm. well i don't claim to understand that one the robbery of the wicked shall destroy them because they refuse to do judgment okay let me maybe the amplified will make it more clear to me the violence of the wicked will return to them and drag them away like a fish caught in a net because they refuse to act with justice Well, another example of the principle of reaping and sowing, you know, normally these things do catch up with you. If you're lying, if you're dishonest, if you're wicked, if you're violent, if you're a, a thief, uh, in the short term, you might get away with it. But if, if that's the way your life is, goes, eventually it's your, your lies and your dishonesty and violence catches up with you. You know, it's like a, big, a fish being caught in a net. It's it's inevitable that you'll get caught in that net. And verse 8. The way of man is froward and strange, but as for the pure, his work is right. The way of man is froward and strange. Froward is is like disagreeable uh, so if you're a disagreeable person uh, as for the pure his work is right okay let's see that in the amplified the way of the guilty is exceedingly crooked but as for the pure his conduct is upright i guess that just goes without saying that that's pretty obvious verse 9 it is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. <laughs> okay, there it is. The first one of several that we're going to see where Solomon is complaining about having a bad wife. He had, I believe he had a thousand of them. I mean, uh, I've been married for 36 years. Took me a long time to mature and and uh, be a good husband and treat my wife the way she deserved. And uh, for a long time, you know, uh, we had strife. Uh, you know, some of these things could also be reversed to when it talks about having a bad wife and what the, the, you know, how miserable it is to live in a house with a bad wife. Well, you could certainly flip it around. Some women might object and say, well, the Bible's sexist. It's talking about women. Well, well the principle applies also. If, if you have a, a really horrible husband, then the wives are miserable living under that same roof with them, too. But Solomon had a thousand wives, so maybe he was quite sensitive to this. Certainly out of a thousand wives, some of them must have nagged him and drove him crazy. And He said it's better. How does he phrase it here? It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. And in the Amplified, that says, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop on the flat roof exposed to weather than in a house shared with a quarrelsome, contentious woman. Well, 
if you've ever tried to live with someone that's quarrelsome and contentious, uh, it's not a it's not a happy environment. It's it's not good to live under the same roof with someone that you you arguing and fighting with all the time, and 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 that goes both ways for a husband or a wife. The next verse, 10, the soul of the wicked desireth evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. Yeah. So, obviously, a wicked person does evil deeds. That's just because they're wicked. That's what they do. You know, good people or spend their time doing good things. And when I say good people, though, I hope you understand that um, when, when we talk about good people from man's perspective, it's all relative goodness. In other words, obviously we can, if you think of everybody you know, you think some of the people you know are really good because and then some of the people are not so good and some of them are darn right bad. Evil, wicked, maybe. So when man can, uh, judges other men, it's, it's, a, it's a scale of relativity, relative goodness. But when God judges man, it's important to understand that no one is good. The scriptures actually says no one is good. No, not one. It says there's not one righteous person. It says even the righteousness of man, the goodness of man, the best man, the best man. In God's sight, he's just like filthy rags. That's what God thinks of our goodness because because no matter how good we are, we still have certain amount of sin. I mean, even if you were, you know, 70% good, 30% sin, you know, God would be disgusted with you. Even if you're 90% good and only 10% sin, you're disgusting. Even if you're 99% good, that just 1% of sinfulness in you is disgusting to, to God. It's you can't be with God at all because sin and God can't mix. And that's why I said earlier that uh, man needs to be saved because no matter how good we think we are, no matter how good we try to be, we have some sinfulness and that sinfulness prevents us from being with God in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. He loved us so much, he became a man, and he died for our sins so that we can have a relationship with him. Um, well, let me look at that in the Amplified. It says, the soul of the wicked desires evil like an addictive substance. <laughs> his neighbor finds no compassion in his eyes. Yeah. Verse 11, when the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. Hmm. The scorner is punished. In the Amplified, it says, when the scoffer is punished, the naive observes the lesson and becomes wise. Um. So I guess it's when you observe someone else that's being punished because they're scornful or a scoffer and they finally are punished for it. They're, they're, they're getting, uh, you know, they're reaping what they're sown and you watch it. You learn from it. If you're, you should gain some wisdom from, from observing that. But it says, but when the wise and teachable person is instructed, he receives knowledge. Yeah, over and over again, it's it. There's the Proverbs gives us a a contrast. If you're a foolish person, 
you're going to end up with bad results in your life. If you're a wise person, you're going to end up with good results in your life. If you're lazy, you end up poor. If you're diligent, you'll end up with plenty. So uh, these, these contrasts are presented throughout the book of Proverbs. That's a good way of a person getting the point. That here's your choice. You can sleep late, stay in bed, sleep late, be lazy, and uh, never have anything in your life and always be lacking and a burden on others. Or, or you can get up early, go to school, take it seriously, get an education, get a career, work hard, be wise, save your money, invest, and you'll always have plenty. That's the contrast. That's the choices that we have. Okay, and now let me see. Verse 12. The righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked, but God overthroweth the wicked for their wickedness. The righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked. How does he consider it? When the Amplified, it says, the righteous one keeps an eye on the house of the wicked, how the wicked are cast down to ruin. Well, it is, it is wise to observe and watch how other people destroy their lives. Um, you know, I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, it's, it's nicknamed Sin City. Even the city itself proudly identifies itself as Sin City. They have a, a campaign, an advertising campaign they started a few years back, and they say, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. In other words, uh, come, whatever you're, you're, you've been afraid to do back home, come to Las Vegas and do it. Any sinful, evil thing you want to do, come here and do it. And no one will ever know. It'll be a secret. So in a way, we've embraced this idea of being Sin City. And uh, we're advertising and promoting the idea. Um, but the truth is, every city is Sin City. Every city is full of sin. And in fact, all the things that happen in Las Vegas, they are happening in uh, Tyler, Texas, in Portland, Oregon, in, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, Miami, Florida, Sacramento, California. Doesn't matter. Name any city. Every city is Sin City. There's sin going on there. All the things they do in Vegas, they're doing back there too. But the difference is there it's more private and secret. Here it's more public and it's being flaunted. But the point is that living in Las Vegas, being born here and growing up here in Las Vegas, I've been able to observe a lot of things because it's done openly. Whereas where you live, Maybe people are sitting more privately and secretly. You haven't been able to observe it as much. But I've observed it. Not only have I observed it, but in my youth, I practiced it. I did pretty much all the, the bad things. If you made a list of bad things, I did them. But here in Las Vegas, I have a chance to observe people drinking alcohol too much and becoming alcoholics and, and their lives are ruined. Same thing with drugs, same thing with gambling, same thing with promiscuity. And I've seen that kind of behavior, that kind of lifestyle, and then I've seen lives ruined and destroyed from it over and over again. I've observed it. I did it, but I was able to be spared. Thank you, Jesus. I was spared because eventually I repented. Repenting means that my eyes were opened. I saw the error and I changed my mind 
and said, I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to live a different way. But I didn't do that until after I first changed my mind about heaven and salvation. And I, I changed my mind and said, I want to know about God. I want to know the purpose of life. I want to know what happens after we die. I started reading this book in December of 1986. My eyes were opened. God revealed to me the truth of these things <clears throat> from the scriptures. And I understood that I needed, I changed my mind. I repented. My, my mind was changed in that I understood I needed Jesus Christ. I, need, I believed in him. I received salvation. I received the Holy Spirit of God living in me. And then after that, my attitude about all these other things that I used to do just started changing. I didn't make a conscious effort. I didn't make a decision. I've got to get a control over the, my life and stop doing these bad things. It's just that the Holy Spirit was transforming me. I'm not claiming that I've been transformed into a perfect person, but I am saying that there's been a dramatic transformation. If you talk to my family or friends that have known me over my whole lifetime, you'd see that uh, you get a testimony that uh, there's a dramatic difference in my life because of the Holy Spirit transforming me. But the, all that being said, in response to this verse, Let me see. Whoop. I can find it here. What verse was I on? Okay, verse 12. Um, the righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked, but God overthroweth the wicked for their wickedness. Is that the one it was on, 12? Yeah. So, um, you get to, if you observe things, if you observe people destroying their lives, if you're wise, you'll learn from their mistakes. Someone told me once many years ago, they said, don't you think that, uh, experience is the best teacher and i said well in a way experience is the best teacher if you learn from your own experience it's a hard tough teacher that's learning the hard way but if you learn from someone else's experience by observing their lives or being taught by them they tell you these are the mistakes i've made don't make the same mistakes that's learning from their experience and that's real wisdom I think in this verse, it's telling us if we observe the lives of the wicked people and see what happens to them, it's a way that to, to teach us, don't do those things, don't make those mistakes. Um, verse 12, whoso stoppeth the, his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. In the Amplified, verse 13, whoever shuts his ears at the cry of the poor will cry out himself and not be answered. Well, that, that gets us to a classification of sin. And that's what we would call a sin of omission. And that's what this is talking about. Um, one type of sin is committing a, a bad act. That's a, that's a sin of commission. You're committing a bad act. Like you stole something. And then there's also this sin of the mind and heart that Jesus talked about. He says, not only is stealing something bad, but desiring what other someone else wants and coveting and being jealous and envious 
then you've already stolen that item in your mind and in your heart. He didn't give that example, but he said, if you've ever hated someone, you've murdered them in your mind and in your heart. If you've ever, if you've ever lusted for someone, you've already committed adultery or fornicate with them in your mind, in your heart, you're already guilty in your mind. So that's sins of the mind and heart rather than sins of commission. But this is referencing sin of omission. And that's failing to do something good when you have an opportunity. And it says, it says, whoever shuts his ears at the cry of the poor will cry out himself and not be answered. You're neglecting to do something good that you're able to do. If someone needs your help and you fail to help them when you're able to, then that's a sin of omission. And it's warning you that, careful, the tables may be turned on you. You may end up poor. Let me see. Maybe I'll do one more verse. Verse 14. A gift in secret pacifieth anger, and a reward in the bosom strong wrath. Oh, God. A gift in secret pacifieth anger, and a reward in the bosom strong wrath. Well, I don't know about you. That sounded like a, a foreign language to me. Let me read it in the, in the Amplified, verse 14. A gift in secret subdues anger, and a bribe hidden in the pocket, strong wrath. Hmm. A bribe. Yeah, that's what we had discussed this many chapters back about uh, a certain type of gift being really referencing a bribery, a reward in the bosom, a bribe hidden in the pocket, like you slip somebody a bribe, you know, strong wrath is will be the result of it. In other words, you're that kind of activity, you're, you're going to, you're going to end up paying for it in the end. Okay, that's verse 14. Let me make a note here. Uh, Proverbs 21, 14 is where we'll pick up next time. I want to have a few minutes remaining here to talk about uh, the, uh, the message of salvation. I've, I've already covered a lot of the important points about salvation in the beginning. So what you, you need to understand is that trying to get into heaven by practicing religion and being religious and, and trying to do good things and, 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 and keep your fingers crossed, hoping, I hope I've done enough and God approves and lets me go to heaven. That, that, that philosophy, that system is doomed to failure. The Bible says it's impossible. Jesus' apostle, apostles asked him about this. They said, then is, how is it possible for anyone to be saved if it's not by doing good and following all the laws and being a good citizen? And he, well, Jesus answered, with man, it is impossible. That's what you need to understand. Trying to work your way to heaven and think that you can earn it and that Heaven is a reward for people who behave and do uh, be, behave properly. Then uh, Jesus said that's impossible. But he said also said, but with God it's possible. You can get to heaven with God if you trust God to do it. And uh, the Bible says that the one you must trust is Jesus. He is God who became a man. Scripture says God was manifest in the flesh. He became flesh and lived among us, Jesus Christ. So with Jesus, it's possible to go to heaven. In fact, it's guaranteed. He promises you if you'll trust him, he'll get you to heaven. 
Stop trying to do it on your own and rely on him instead. That's what we want you to understand. But I also want you to know not only who he is, but what he's done for you. And that is that he is God. He became a man. And he said he became a man in order to die. That's why he had to become a man to die on a cross. And by dying on that cross, he paid for our sins. So thank Jesus right now. Thank him. Say, thank you, Jesus. You've paid for my sins. And believe that your sins have completely been paid for. Now sin is not the issue. The issue between you and God is not sin because Jesus paid for your sins. You should be eternally grateful for that. The issue now is faith. Will you put your faith in Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life? Or will you say, I don't need Jesus. I'll do it on my own. That's the question. Uh, salvation is offered to you as a free gift. That's what the Bible says. It, the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you want to go to heaven and have eternal life, it, Jesus is offering, as a, offering it to you right now as a gift if you put your faith in him. Uh, so you can't work for it and earn it. You can't buy it. You can't purchase by donating to charities or giving to money to churches. You can't bribe your way, buy your way into heaven. You can't work for it and earn it because then you could boast to God and say, you owe me, God. I deserve heaven because of all the things I've done. The Bible says, no, there be no boasting. You can't get into heaven through your as a reward for being so good. Instead, it says that you just need to trust Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Now, I said that he died for our sins, but the, the fantastic part of the story is it, it doesn't end with his death. He, after three days in the tomb, he raised himself from the dead. Bodily. It wasn't a spiritual resurrection, something from another dimension, you know. His body was brought back to life, and he walked for 40 days with 500 witnesses. They saw him, they touched him, they spoke with him, they ate with him. Now, this resurrection is really, really important because that's the proof that he gave us that he is God and that he has power over life and death. Even though he died, he showed us, look, I can defeat death. I can bring myself back to life. And he promises he will raise you in a resurrection to life everlasting. If you've trusted him, he promises you a resurrection into life everlasting. So put your faith in him now. If you do that, if you do put your faith in Jesus tonight, please make a comment on this video. And once you put your faith in him, then it's you're guaranteed that you're going to go to heaven. And, and, and it's irreversible and it's irrevocable because the Bible says he cannot change his mind about it. He cannot take it back. He promises you you're going to go to heaven if you trust him. And it, the Bible says he cannot break his promise. Jesus does not break a promise. He doesn't lie. So if you should be really happy because all you've got to do is trust Jesus completely and you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven no matter what. And then... The Holy Spirit of God lives in you and starts transforming you. Thank you for watching. I hope you join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.